What do you know, another multicolor printer that claims speed, quality, and value. Let's see if that's the case. Today we're looking at the FlashForge AD5X, a machine that promises to safely usher even beginners into the world of fast multicolor 3D printing, all while maintaining a high level of quality and only commanding 400 of your finest dollars. But does it deliver? Well, let's open the thing up and find out. Today I want to run through my initial impressions and experience putting this machine together. I'm going to go over some of the specs that it boasts, as well as cover some of the issues that I've had using this printer. But most importantly, I want to cover all of the things that I really enjoy about this unit, and we might even talk about some of the prints that I've run off. So let's dive in, shall we? All of them is like, okay, here's the printer and it's got the multicolor thing inside of it. This one's multicolor and it's a little bit different. Here we go. This printer is a box that comes inside of another box. As we move inside of that box, we're met with something that we find on a lot of these machines, a bunch of foam and a bunch of plastic. Everything seems to be well wrapped and it comes out fairly easily. And my immediate impressions are very positive. Dude, it's such a cute little, I didn't realize this was an open frame machine. It is like a little tiny baby. The machine's an open frame Core XY printer with a super cute build volume of 220 by 220 by 220. It is a little bit smaller than the more common 250 cube that we're seeing on most printers these days, and it shows. But inside that open frame of the machine, we find a bunch of foam that holds the remainder of the components we need to put this thing together. Everything in here ships super compact and securely. And with that foam and accessories removed, we find the IFS. This is FlashForge's multicolor unit, and this is the thing that I was most excited about with this setup. What does IFS stand for? Intelligent Filament System. It's so intelligent. Anyway, Creality's got the CFS, Bamboo has the AMS, Anycubic has the ACE, Cheaty has the Cheaty Box. They just called it the Cheaty Box. I like that. You like that? But FlashForge has the IFS. Now with all these multicolor Core XY printers coming out recently, it's cool to come across one that's approaching the market just a little bit differently. But more on that later, let's put everything together here. Elbows. Oh, so these have the same kind of design as the, the AMS Lite, where they're like sprung one way. So are these ones sprung this way and those ones sprung the opposite way? Are any of them sprung the opposite way? Yeah. That one's sprung like that. Whoa, these are... So that holds tension. Yeah, that makes sense. Hmm, cool. As we prepare to install the IFS and the spool holders, we need to remove these bed screws that hold the print bed in place during shipping. This is commonly done to protect the components during shipping to make sure nothing gets damaged and nothing comes loose in general. Similarly, the screen is held in place using its own bracket as well. With that removed from the bracket, the screen can be installed on the machine and plugged into this unfortunately fiddly, fragile ribbon cable. It's always these gosh darn flimsy ribbon cables, every time. But moving on from there, the rest of the assembly and preparation comes on the multicolor side of the machine. The spool holders all slide onto these brackets on the side, and the IFS has its own bracket that mounts just above all of them. Yup. Oh, uh, now we're cooking. Yep, that's the exact way it goes. This allows the filament to feed directly into the IFS with minimal redirection. From there, we simply install the PTFE collector deal that goes right on top of the tool head. This takes all four of the outputs from the IFS and feeds them into the tool head. And that's about the size of it. There's one cable that connects the IFS to the machine so it can both power the unit and communicate with the printer. And we can move right along from there. We're all set up. It's just as easy as that. Now before we move on, I need to point out something that I already absolutely love about this printer. The way they've got everything set up here is just excellent. Right now we're in this weird age of four color single nozzle printers. Bamboo kind of set that stage. It's not the most efficient way to do it, but it works well enough. And as a result of Bamboo doing this a few years ago, everybody's doing it more or less. Now, a lot of people have issue with the waste that these systems generate, and that's a thing for sure, but my real issue is more so with the packaging. 
so the standard setup with the multicolor box that sits on top or on the side of the machine, that works fine enough. That's a good format. It's clean. It packages well. Still produces a lot of waste, but it works. And really, that's probably the most common. But if we look at something like the A-Series from Bamboo, that thing's an absolute mess. That combo just does not sit well on a bench, for example. Perhaps the A1 is a bit better when you've got the AMS light mounted to the top of the machine. But in my case, having multiple A1 minis, for example, is just terrible. It's super cumbersome. But the thing that really makes this system a bummer is the fact that the AMS light is way better than the standard AMS. In fact, it's way more reliable than any other multicolor unit out there. That's right, it may be a hot take, but the AMS light is the most reliable multicolor unit. You can fight me. But what I mean when I say that is the spools are mounted by these spokes here. They're mounted from the center of the spool instead of relying on the multicolor unit to roll the spool from the outside. And I can't tell you how many print hours I've missed out on because I had a machine pause overnight just because there was an issue with the spool rolling properly or not retracting correctly because it couldn't roll right. Especially using cardboard spools, I have a lot of reliability issues, but the first year that I owned my Bamboo AMS and P1S combo, I didn't have any issues with cardboard spools. You all commented about how you need adapter rings and how do you print with cardboard spools and I have these issues and blah blah blah. I never had any issues. I thought you all were crazy. Well, you know what? That jinxed me. It ruined my perfect run. Because now I've got nothing but issues using cardboard spools in my AMSs. Doesn't matter if it's an AMS, a CFS, an ACE, all of them. Issues with cardboard spools. That was never a problem, but you guys brought this on. Where was I going with this? Oh yeah, the AMS light uses these spokes to mount the spool from the center. The FlashForge 85X also does a similar thing. And it is so good. It's so good. It's fantastic. But then they took it a step further and made it even better by mounting these spokes to the side of the printer. So not only do we get the super reliable method of dispensing and retracting filament by using the spokes instead of rolling the roll, the packaging concerns with the other system that uses this kind of setup aren't even a problem because it's just mounted to the side of the printer. It sits there as one complete compact unit. What an excellent idea. I am such a fan of this. We're not even talking about how this thing prints yet and I'm totally a fan. And that's coming from a bamboo fanboy. If you're a bamboo fanboy and you want a team bamboo shirt like this one I'm wearing, you can go to keoprints.com and get you one. If you hate bamboo and you want a never bamboo shirt, you can also get one of those at keoprints.com. We're inclusive. All right, quickly, let's talk about numbers. We already touched on the build volume of 220 cubed, but what else do we have going on here? Well, there's a hot end that melts plastic. In fact, it'll melt plastic up to 300 degrees Celsius. And that bed that we spoke about heats up to 110 Celsius. Now that's all kind of standard, but it's also important to talk about some of the things that are missing from this machine when we're talking about specs. For example, this machine does not come with an enclosure. Although FlashForge did send me this upgrade kit that encloses the machine. Let me know if you'd like to see me throw that together in a future video on this printer. Also, this machine doesn't come with a camera, which is kind of atypical of this segment of product these days. But aside from those items, we've got the usual kit. We've got a tool head that's got the filament cutter, along with the regular sensors for bed leveling, filament runout, acceleration for vibration compensation and stuff. There's a touch screen that looks pretty good and works well enough. And I'm very happy to report that this machine's got these little cutouts in the bottom. These make the thing much easier to carry around. That's right, they put handles on this machine. If you follow this channel closely, you'll know that I'm a fan of printers that have handles on them. I'm a simple man. You just give me a printer with handles on it, and I'm happy. <sighs> Love me some handles. Now it's not all butterflies and rainbows. This printer actually did give me some grief initially. After first setting everything up, I ran off one of the preloaded prints just to make sure everything was working fine. I printed out this coin, it used two colors, it was on the machine already, so... It was a good test to see that I plugged everything in where it was supposed to be and stuff like that. Right, yeah, take that off of there, give it the, the waggle. <laughs> Flex that plate. Oh yeah. 
Oh, oh. Hey. Well, so yeah, it's two colors. It is two colors. You know what? It turned out pretty clean. It only took 10 to 15 minutes. It was a great result. But the issue started when I decided to hop into Orca Slicer and send my own prints to the machine. Um, the short version is that did not work. The machine connected well enough to Orca Slicer, but the IFS didn't quite communicate properly. So basically what happened was nothing would print in multicolor correctly. I mean, all the toolpaths were there because it was a multicolor print, but it wouldn't actually change colors. Of course, after switching to Orca Flash Forge, this was remedied. Though that came with its own issues, and I'll cover those in just a second. But once I was able to get the correct slicer and load up some prints that were actually multicolor, the next issue arose. For some reason, I kept getting this error. So I ended up speaking with my contact at FlashForge, and after a little bit of back and forth and trial and error, They found me some working firmware and I loaded it onto the machine. And once I did that, all the issues were gone. In fact, this marked the end of the issues that I had with this printer. Like, it fixed the problem and then the following hundreds of hours that I've done since that issue have been flawless. I don't want to speak too soon since this is kind of an initial impressions video, not a full review, but I was expecting to have more issues since I was met with issues right off the bat. And there just weren't any more. Like, that was it. And these prints are coming out super well. So again, I'm gonna really try and stress it out and do a little bit more printing before I talk about the quality of these prints more in depth. But so far, I'm very impressed with the quality I am getting. Like, surprisingly impressed. Unfortunately, I need to talk about something that is not good. Orca Flash Forge, let's talk about that for a second, shall we? You guys probably know how I feel about reskin slicers. And if you don't, you should know that I don't like them. I think if a company wants to rip off Bamboo or Prusa Slicer or Orca Slicer and just put their colors over the top of it, may as well just use the original Slicer instead of putting their name on the reskinned version of it. I can hear the comments now. Ooh, Bamboo ripped off Prusa Slicer. Oh, Prusa Slicer ripped off Super Slicer. Blah, 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 blah. But often the issue we have here with these quick reskins is you get a slicer that has fewer features or runs slower or a combination of all of that. And unfortunately Orca Flash Forge has been no exception for me. I don't want to stay in the weeds too much because I've covered this a lot on my channel but here are my main complaints with this specific one. The slicer had issues connecting to the printer and reliably staying connected to the printer. Once you log into a Flash Forge account and you register the machine and connect it to the slicer you can bind the printer so it becomes discoverable, and that works out just fine. Initially, this took me way too long to achieve, but the printer's connected now, and it works. Unfortunately, if you're like me, every time you jump back into the slicer, the machine may be recognized, but the IFS will not be. For whatever reason, my IFS is never updated in the slicer. The machine's there, but it just doesn't show any IFS information. However, I have found that if you interact with the machine inside of the slicer, it actually forces the IFS to update. For me, that just means I gotta flick the light off and on from the slicer and bam, we've got filament information from the IFS. That is to say, the device page has filament information. Which leads me to my next major complaint about the slicer, the lack of filament syncing across the device page and the prepare page. Usually, in the prepare tab, there's a filament sync option. That allows you to preview your print using the colors that are loaded onto the machine. That way, if you load new colors into the machine and update that information on the IFS, the changes are reflected while you're preparing your print or adding colorization or anything like that. And you know what? That makes a lot of sense. Well, for some reason, Orca Flash Forge does not have a facility to sync your IFS information in the device tab and the filament information in the prepare tab. 
So unless I'm missing something, you just have to manually input your filament information in the prepare tab so you can preview it using the information that you have loaded on the machine. So each time I just mirror the information in both places. And I mean, who doesn't want to do that twice, right? Right? But my final gripe is maybe a little bit nitpicky, I guess. It has to do with the dark mode support on this slicer. This may be specific to my setup because I'm using a MacBook with dark mode enabled by default, but this is an iOS version of Orca Flash Forge, so I feel like there should be support for this. I don't know, maybe I'm asking a lot here. But seriously, look at this page. You can't actually tell what you're clicking on. You can't navigate anywhere because the background is white and the text is also white. And this is actually one of the biggest reasons why it took me so long to get this printer connected with the slicer. Again, maybe nitpicky, but this was a huge struggle for me. Let me know if I'm alone on that because I feel like it's a very specific thing. Anyway, that's it. That's my rant against the reskin slicers. You guys have probably heard it before. As long as manufacturers are doing this stuff, I'm gonna continue mentioning it. Now let's move on to some stuff that I like because I really do like this printer, like a lot more than I thought I would. Now let's talk about printing. I'm not gonna go too deep on this like I mentioned because this is an initial impressions video and not a full in-depth review, but I've been able to throw like 100 hours at this machine and I've gotta say I'm very impressed. Aside from the initial firmware issues I had at the beginning, the reliability has been excellent. I've been able to print orders for my Etsy store and maintain quality like my bamboo printers that I typically use. Team Bamboo Shirt, KeoPrints.com. The multicolor system appears to be absolutely rock solid. And you can tell when you look at some of the multicolor pieces I've pulled off of this printer so far. I'll dive deeper in future videos, but initial results here are incredibly positive. For example, look at this plate of multicolor nachos. There's not a single model that failed and they all turned out super clean. No stringing, no issues. Incredibly clean little tiny nachos. This print alone tells me how good this machine is because this is kind of a stress test. All of these individual little models with a tiny contact patch and you add the complexity of multicolor on top of it like this is not an easy thing to pull off this clean or this reliably. But the AD5X didn't skip a beat. You can also take a look at this multicolor tank thing that I printed off. It's a little bit bigger than one of those tiny nachos, so it's a little bit easier to see the boundaries between color changes and stuff. Everything looks clean. There's no bleed. It's all crisp and looks great. Heck, the support material on the barrel even came off clean. It's good. It's good. I did have some issues with the standard filament profiles, but again, I'll go into that a little bit deeper in another video. Overall, the printing experience has been excellent. So that's as far as I'm gonna go today with the experience of opening the machine and beginning to print with it, but I haven't stopped printing with it. I'll prepare my thoughts as I have more time to stress this machine out and put some hours on it. But overall, my first impressions are excellent. The multicolor system is a refreshing change of format that appears to be exceptionally stable. The software and firmware leaves a bit to be desired, but that seems to be common of just about any printer in this room. Except the bamboos, am I right? I'm a bamboo fanboy. If you want your team bamboo shirts like this, go to keoprints.com. If you hate bamboo and you want your never bamboo shirts, go to keoprints.com. Then we can all like what we like and hate what we hate together. If you like what you're seeing in this video, check the affiliate links below. That's a great way to support this channel and help us continue to devote time to doing printer reviews and stuff like this. Check out our second channel, it's called You Like That, if you want to see more 3D printing content. And comment below what you want to see as I review this printer further. I've got a few videos lined up already, so you're going to be seeing more of it on the channel. But if there's anything specific or questions that you have, let me know. Thanks to FlashForge for sending this over free of charge. Again, check the link in the description if you want to learn more. Bye.